part three of the Collins KWM2 transceiver repair. In this video we're going to investigate that intermittent filament voltage and hopefully finally resolve the low negative voltage that goes to the output tubes. So here we go. So for review I have a handful of tubes in the KWM2 that are intermittently lighting. In other words I don't see the filaments coming on at times and sometimes they do. The tubes that appear to have the problem are V1, V3, V4, across here, V12, V2, you see that string. These are the ones that I have noticed that are not lighting all the time as they should. So they're fed by the six volt filament line coming up from the power supply. So it's on the rear connector of the KWM2. So what I thought I'd do for a nifty way of determining problem is I'm using a tube extender. I've actually soldered some wires to pins 4 and 5 on V1, which was the first one I noticed that was out, and I was going to monitor that on a VTVM. i show you guys a really nice way to use the quick response of an analog meter to find an intermittent. However, in the process, I found out what the real cause was. And it does not happen to be in the transceiver. It has to do with the power supply. So let me show you what's going on there. All right, back to the schematic. Remember I said that this string up here is intermittent, but other tubes in the radio are fine. If you look at the power supply connector, which is right here, you see that the filament, the 6-volt AC, comes in on two pins. It comes on an 8 and 9. I thought, oh, maybe I should take a look a little closer at that power supply cable and see if maybe I have a loose connection in, in one of these wires, right? Well, it turned out to be something else. Let me show you. All right, so as I stated, I'm using a Heathkit VTVM to look at the 6-volt AC filament circuit in the KWM2. So for a word of precaution, if you look back at the schematic, you'll see that pin 5 on all those tubes goes to chassis ground and pin 4 is actually the AC high coming off of the power supply. So when you hook up your VTVM make sure that you're getting that polarity correct because the VTVM has this like phono plug okay and the outside of that goes to the case of the meter which goes to the ground terminal on the AC plug right. So for a little precaution Use yourself one of these <clears throat> ground isolators, okay? And of course, make sure that you have your low side of that filament circuit, meaning chassis, connected to the low side of this phono plug. Then you'll have no issues. So I've got the KWM2 fired up with a 516 power supply. And I'm monitoring that filament circuit on the VTVM. We're on the 15 volt scale, and you can see there's nothing. And yep, those tubes are not lit, okay? So I was gonna walk you guys through, taking my little tweaker here, poking around on the chassis and see if we could spot that needle deflecting when I find the bad connection, which I can't really demonstrate because the problem's not here. <clears throat> when I was setting this up, I plugged in my power supply cable, of course, set the radio on its side because I wanted to watch the meter as I was tweaking around, and when I moved the cable, See that? I'm moving the power supply cable. See that deflection? So the problem's not in here. The problem's in that connector or the contacts. So let's take a look. So here's that 11 pin power supply cable. And I know you can't see in there too well, but I can. And all I see is black and deformed contacts. This guy's obviously been around for a long time. It's probably had a lot of mate and demate operations, and it's bad. It needs to be changed. Now, we also had that negative bias issue 
Remember I told you I really couldn't get that negative bias? This could be part of that problem. But it's definitely causing the intermittent filament lighting and it could also be interfering with like high voltage when you're keying this guy up, pulling some current because there is a lot of arcing evidence inside of these pins. So we've got to change it. So luckily I happen to have an Amphenol 11 pin connector on hand and this is the type that goes here with the hood on it, right? You can't use like a standard tube socket because it's got the flanges and this hood will not hook on the back of it. So that would be a very bad maneuver, right? So you have to get one of these. And unfortunately, if you look these jobbers up on eBay for the original Amphenols, they're like 30 bucks a pop. So check your junk boxes, guys. If you got these, you better hang on to them. So I've got the shell off. You can see this heat shrink tubing with some evidence that somebody has been in here in the past. I don't know if this is actually the original. But you have to put these insulators on every terminal because remember, this is a mix of your filament circuits plus like 800 volts DC or so for the plate. There's also 275 volts and the negative bias. It's all here. So you got to be very careful when you wire this up. You don't want to get this wiring wrong or it'd be disastrous. So to make sure I don't goof up, I'm going to make me a little list of the color codes on these wires and one of these pins I noticed is not used. So I'm going to get that all documented to make sure that it works right the first time. So I pulled the heat shrink tubing back here. As you can see, it made a little discovery. Pin 3, the shield on the connector, the wire is actually broken. There's a lot of solder float in here, so I think this failed in the past and somebody just tried to re-solder it. But what I'm going to do is come back here, remove the insulation, and start all these connections new. There's the old socket. And the new one's installed now on the power supply cable. I verified it against the schematic of the power supply to make sure nothing was miswired or shorted, so we're ready to test. Here we go. We kill the lights in case something goes wrong, see any sparkies or smoke. Right off the bat, those tubes are lighting right up. Right there, those 6AN8s, I believe. They were not lighting and now they are, but my negative bias is still low. It's at negative 52. So it didn't help that, but it solved the intermittent tube filaments. So that's good. So I believe I know what's going on with the negative bias. This resistor right there that I'm pointing at is R8, and then this power supply, it's 4700 ohms, just like you'd see in this schematic here, right? However, if you take a look at the 516 AC power supply schematic, and this version, it shows that it's a 3300 ohm resistor. So I believe that Collins was adjusting R8 depending on what transmitter the 516 was teamed up with. Now remember, this power supply did not come with this radio. The original one had failed. So I'm going to replace R8 with this value and I bet you that our negative bias increases. All right, I removed the 4700. I have a 3300 in there. Let's check our negative bias. You see we jumped up right around 10 volts. So I can still decrease it, but I can't go any higher now than negative 64 volts. So obviously we're going to change the value of that resistor again until I can get somewhere around 70 to 80 volts negative bias. Still working on the power supply. I ended up changing the 5.6K resistor that was also in the bias circuit. It was up over 6,000 ohms. So now, hopefully, with that and the other resistor I replaced, which is now a 2200 ohm resistor, let's see what we got for our negative bias range. So negative 70. 
I should be able to go above that now. Yep, negative 76. And of course I can swoop down below it. But the target that I'm seeing is somewhere around negative 70 volts. So we're gonna set it there. And then we'll check the idle current on the output tubes, okay? Now you may say, well what's the deal? How come you're swapping out these resistors? Just remember that sometimes you do have to change resistors, especially something like this where you're looking for a precise voltage because our line voltage has changed from the day when this power supply was built. We're up around 123 to 125 volts now and probably when they did this power supply it was around 117 which changes all the voltage levels in this power supply. So yeah, sometimes you do have to tweak little resistor rates like this to get that precision voltage that you're after. Okay, I've got the radio on, dummy load is connected. So what we're gonna see now is, when I go into transmit, can I set the 40 milliamps idle current on the outputs like the manual says. So to do this and be safe, I need to put my camera on a tripod. I'm gonna need both hands. All right, so here we go. I'll watch the meter. There's our current. I'm gonna adjust the bias. You can see I have a good range now of bias adjustment. Right there is about 40 mils, so we should be good to go. Next step is to see what kind of power I get out of this thing, but I really think we're on the road now. So that's a wrap, part three of the Collins KWM2 repair. In this video, we finally solved the issue with the filaments not lighting on several tubes in the radio, which turned out to be that power supply connector. And you know, if I'd really inspected this thing to begin with, after seeing the wear marks on it, I probably would have spotted that and probably would have made this process a lot easier because I did a lot of work with the intermittent connections on my power supply. Bummer. But anyway, we caught it. Also now, the negative bias is at the right level for setting the 40 milliamps idle current on the finals with plenty of adjustment either way. In the next part, we're gonna fire this thing up into a dummy load and go through the tune-up procedure, see if I can get full power out, and see if my neutralization circuit is doing the job. We'll see you then.